On April 17, 1975, the Khmer Rouge captured Phnom Penh after an eight-year revolution. Up until then, little was known about the Khmer Rouge, but once in power, in January 1976, the Khmer Rouge changed the country's name to Democratic Kampuchea, and in April of that year, its leader, Pol Pot, was named as the country's prime minister. And in September 1976, Pol Pot declared that his government was communist in ideology. Pol Pot ruled as a dictator over a one-party militarized state. In foreign relations, Kampuchea isolated itself from much of the international community. A small number of foreign embassies operated in Phnom Penh. But as foreign travel to Kampuchea was tightly restricted, the country was virtually cut off from the rest of the world. As a result, apart from official government pronouncements, practically nothing was known by the outside world about the true conditions in the country during the Khmer Rouge period. During the Cambodian Civil War, the Khmer Rouge prepared a list of high-ranking government and military leaders whom they targeted for execution. Instead, after the war, the Khmer Rouge arrested and executed hundreds of thousands of government officials, military officers, businessmen, academics and intellectuals, teachers, and anyone who had played even only a moderate role in or were identified with the former regime. As a result, professional people, including doctors and engineers, technicians, and anyone who possessed some education or skill training, did not reveal their backgrounds and pretended to belong to the common people. Even then, the Khmer Rouge arrested and killed those who wore eyeglasses, spoke French or other foreign languages, or anyone it considered to be an intellectual, or had been part of the former regime, or displayed some Western influence. The Khmer Rouge applied radical measures to speed up the country's transition to communism. Banks were closed down and money was abolished. Industries were dismantled as the government focused on agricultural production. Schools were also closed down and their teachers were executed. The practice of religion, although guaranteed by the Khmer Rouge constitution, was severely suppressed. Thousands of Buddhist monks were executed or forced to become farm workers. Buddhist images were destroyed, and temples and pagodas were turned into prisons and execution sites. Other religions were persecuted as well. To end all knowledge of and ties to the past, the Khmer Rouge destroyed libraries and burned all books. On April 17, 1975, a few hours after capturing Phnom Penh, the Khmer Rouge ordered all residents to leave their homes and move to the countryside. The order to leave was both urgent and mandatory. Those who resisted were killed. There were no exceptions, and even the sick and the elderly were ordered to leave. Hospitals were closed down and the patients, regardless of their medical conditions, were evacuated, some still in their beds and attached to their IV tubes. Within a few days, Phnom Penh was completely depopulated, with all its residents, comprising some 2.5 million people or 30% of the country's population, and taking only a few belongings, making their way in long convoys in ox carts, motorbikes, scooters, and bicycles, but mostly on foot to the rural areas across the country. The Khmer Rouge order was for all persons to return to their ancestral villages. At the core of the Khmer Rouge Marxist ideology was its desire to achieve the purest form of communism, that of a classless society. The Khmer Rouge also advocated ultranationalism and anti-imperialism and desired to eliminate foreign control and achieve national self-sufficiency, first through the phased collectivized agricultural development of the countryside. The decision to depopulate Phnom Penh was part of the Khmer Rouge plan to turn the country into a single collectivized agricultural-based socialist utopia worked by the peasant farmers in a classless society. The Khmer Rouge drew its inspiration from the ancient Khmer Empire, whose wealth and power came from its vast agricultural estates. The Khmer Rouge also sought to duplicate this past greatness but under the principles of Marxism and ultranationalism. The Khmer Rouge viewed the Cambodian countryside as the means to achieve pure communism, self-sufficiency, and isolation from foreign influences. During the Cambodian Civil War, the Khmer Rouge owed much of its success to the rural areas where it had established its first permanent bases and from where it relied on rural support for its food, information, recruits, and sanctuaries. By contrast, the Khmer Rouge did not gain any support from the urban areas, which it viewed as decadent, West and capitalism corrupted and must be eliminated as they served no purpose for the transformation of the country into a full communist state. 
In September 1975 through 1976 and 1977, the Khmer Rouge carried out similar depopulations in other regions across Kampuchea where the residents of the towns and the cities were forced to move to the countryside. The Khmer Rouge separated the general population into two groups, old people, also called base people or full rights people, and new people. The old people were the peasants, villagers, and essentially those who had supported the Khmer Rouge during the Cambodian Civil War and were deemed essential to the nation's communist transformation. Also designated as old people were party cadres, government officials, and military personnel. The new people were the evacuated residents of the towns and cities, including the civilian and military components of the previous regime and essentially those who did not support the Khmer Rouge during the war and who were deemed non-essential to the socialist revolution and thus were expendable. On arriving at their destinations, the new people were organized into brigades to begin work in agrarian communes. Collectivized farming was the cornerstone of the Khmer Rouge regime and communal farms were set up all across the country, consisting of separate old people and new people communes. The Khmer Rouge called the start of its socialist revolution Year Zero when it planned to wipe out everything that had come before it and establish a new Kampuchean state that would achieve greatness equal to that of the ancient Khmer Empire. The communal farms that were set up were slave labor camps where people worked every day from dawn to dusk, sometimes up to 10 or 11 at night, doing farm work such as growing crops, clearing forests, draining swamps, digging irrigation ditches, and building dams. There were no rest days and all work was done by hand or using basic tools, but no machineries. Rest breaks and meals were restricted and inadequate and work quotas and regulations were strictly enforced. Exhaustion and illness were deemed equivalent to laziness, while complaining about the work or foraging for root crops, vegetables, or fruit in the forest or wayside for personal consumption were subject to severe punishment. Taking anything from the ground or water was considered stealing from the state. These rules were administered by armed dudes, some as young as 12 years old. Men and women were segregated into separate living and dining quarters, and marital relations were restricted to specified schedules. Social life was eliminated, with religious holidays, celebrations, music, and dance forbidden, as were courtship and family life. Private ownership was prohibited. The fields, farmlands, crops, and all items in the communes, even the clothes and utensils a person used, were state property. Workers were subjected to revolutionary teachings. The government, which was identified only as Ankar, was described as the all-powerful, all-knowing, and benevolent entity that worked only for the common good. Unknown and unseen, Ankar was feared by all. The highest-ranking leaders of the Kemruj regime, referred to as Ankar Lo, were hardly known or rarely seen by the general population. A worker who violated any regulation was given a warning. Three warnings automatically led to an invitation by Ankar, which meant death by execution. Executions were usually carried out at nightfall in a wooded area just outside the commune. The Kemeruj considered children as indispensable to the socialist revolution and thus housed them collectively and separately from their parents and indoctrinated them into communist teachings. Children were also trained to reject their parents and families, to submit to Ankar, and to hate their enemies. Children were made to feel no sympathy or emotions and were trained to kill animals in violent ways. The Khmer Rouge particularly targeted the new people who, having lived in the towns and the cities, were unprepared for agrarian work and lifestyle. As well, the regime's harshest policies were directed at them. In the first year, the new people population declined considerably as a result of overwork, sickness and disease, summary executions and starvation. The Khmer Rouge also took away most of the harvest, which left the new people communes with insufficient food supplies. In 1977, Pol Pot launched a purge of the party. The purge was most intense in the eastern zone, where some 200,000 local cadres were killed in massacres. Thereafter, the Khmer Rouge also targeted party and military cadres whom they believed were traitors. Suspected disloyal cadres were sent to interrogation and detention centers, which were actually torture and execution facilities. 
These institutions were originally established to prosecute counter-revolutionaries, that is, persons identified with the previous regime. But it soon became packed with arrested communist cadres as the purges intensified. Some 200 such facilities existed, which included Security Prison 21 or S-21 at Tolslang, Phnom Penh, where many civilian and military cadres, including those with higher ranking positions, were imprisoned, tortured, and executed. Various forms of exceedingly brutal tortures were employed that forced prisoners to confess to committing nonsensical crimes which prison authorities had prepared beforehand. In many cases, prisoners were forced to implicate members of their own family who were then arrested and subjected to the same tortures. After a period of detention, the prisoners were taken to another location where they were executed and buried in mass graves. To save on ammunition, the Khmer Rouge executioners rarely shot their prisoners. Instead, the executions were carried out using a pickaxe, iron bar, or wooden club, which were struck on the prisoners' head, killing them. The Khmer Rouge killed a large number of Cambodians. Various estimates place the total death toll of the Cambodian genocide at between 1.5 and 2.5 million people to even as high as 3 million, with about half of the fatalities caused by executions and the rest due to overwork, starvation, sickness, and diseases. Starting in the 1990s, some 20,000 mass graves have been unearthed containing the skeletal remains of some 1.4 million executed prisoners. These mass graves are more commonly known as the killing fields, that is, they were the execution sites used by the Khmer Rouge. The Cambodian genocide ended in early January 1979 with the overthrow of the Khmer Rouge regime following the Vietnamese invasion of Cambodia. After two decades of war, in late 1991, peace was restored to Cambodia. In 1997, the Cambodian government began efforts to investigate the mass killings that occurred during the Khmer Rouge era. In June 2003, Cambodia and the United Nations established the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia to prosecute high-ranking Khmer Rouge leaders for various crimes including genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. A number of top Khmer Rouge officials have since been found guilty of committing criminal acts.